Today is March the 30th, 2021. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program in the library. And with me is Harry Birdwell, who had a 16 year career at OSU. I hope I have that, that year correct. 1989 to 2005, is that correct? Yes. Okay. First is the Vice President for Business and External Relations. And then the last three and a half or so years as athletic director. And you're currently the chief operating officer for Newmark. Correct. Okay. And this interview is being recorded with Zoom and will be part of our the We Will Remember Promise oral history collection. And by way of context, uh, 20 years ago, January 27, 2001, a plane crashed carrying 10 men associated with the Oklahoma State University men's basketball program. And in the aftermath, the university and the cowboy community made a promise to always remember those lost that day. And at that time, uh, Mr. Birdwell was the, the VP here at OSU. And then he became the athletic director a little bit later. So thank you for joining us today. And let's, before we get to that, that uh, day in January, 20 years ago. Let's learn a little bit about you. Start wherever you like. Well, um, let's see. Let's let's just start with OSU. I came from a small community in rural Oklahoma in the southwest part of the state. And from Fletcher, Oklahoma, which had 888 people when I graduated from high school in 1967, I arrived on the OSU campus in the fall of 67 uh, with about 17,500 students uh, on campus at that time. I thought it was the biggest place I had ever been, uh, but I soon fell in love with OSU and, uh, um, and have had a lifelong love affair since. Uh, I had a significant professional career before coming to the university that included uh, uh, being the uh, uh, general manager of the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce and the, uh, the uh, executive director of the state rural electric cooperatives um, and being in the investment banking business. And I came to OSU in, as you said, 1989 and was uh, fortunate to be uh, in the employ of OSU for 17 years my life changed, but my affection only grew for OSU. Uh, since I left OSU, I uh, spent uh, a decade as the head of, uh, of the state uh, school land uh, commission, the commissioners of the land office. And then a year ago, I became the uh, chief operating officer for uh, a very large and prominent uh, commercial real estate uh, brokerage and management firm, uh, Robinson, uh, excuse me, Newmark Robinson Park in uh, Oklahoma City. So if you graduated from high school in 67, you would have graduated from OSU in? 72. 72. There was a year there. Uh, in 1970, when I was elected national president of the FFA, and so I was off campus for a year traveling and representing that organization and uh, traveling the world and, uh, and working with youth around the country and in several uh, international uh, settings. And uh, that was a great opportunity for me as well. What was your major? Uh, I majored in uh, uh, journalism and broadcasting at OSU with a minor in pre-law. And then following, uh, following my undergraduate program at OSU, I went to the University of Oklahoma and received my Juris Doctor there. Okay. And, and when you left uh, Fletcher, what were your plans at that point, Did your career plans at that point from high school? Uh, well, I'm not, sure what, I'm not sure what they were, but, okay. uh, but I'm not sure I could have mapped out anything more <laughs> Uh, more breathtaking and more enjoyable and rewarding than what I've done. Well, while you were here as a student, what were you involved with 
FFA, of course, but for anything else? Well, several things. Um, I actually came to OSU when Mr. Iba asked me if I would like to come play basketball at OSU. And I did for a while, not very well, but I did for a while and then was injured at the end of my freshman year. Um, I was uh, I was active in student government and became the student government president at, at OSU in my uh, senior year. So I was uh, I was an active student and uh, enjoyed all the the fun things that students did. Probably didn't spend as much time uh, in my academic uh, uh, endeavors, but uh, but did well and uh, thoroughly enjoyed the undergraduate experience. Well, I have to ask, did you spend much time in the library? Well, you know, I have laughed over time and, and, and said that there were times in my, uh, in my academic career that I, uh, that I looked toward the center of campus and said, what's that big building over there? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Uh, yes, I did spend a lot of time. Um, as a matter of fact, before uh, the internet and before all of the, the technological uh, advancements of the last 30 years, uh, the undergraduate students spent an awful lot of time, particularly those who were in uh, Greek houses. There was, there was enforced uh, study hall in the library. Mm -hmm. So yes, I spent a lot of time <laughs> in the library. So I take it you were in a fraternity? I was. I was a member of Farmhouse. Okay. For sure. <laughs> and you, did you win any house decks while you were a member? Well, we did. We, we uh, uh, at that time, Farmhouse was located on the north end of campus instead of in the south uh, campus where most of the Greek system is, is located now. Uh, so we were we were sort of separated from from the balance of the Greek system then, but yeah, we participated in lots of things like spring singing and varsity review and uh, and the annual homecoming uh, displays and that sort of thing. Okay, and so when you graduated, you went directly into grad school, or did you work law from law school from OSU? Oh, and I and and probably the most important is that I did I did meet my wife Cindy uh, at OSU and now uh, we're working on our 48th year toward happily ever after and so uh, so that was a blessing of OSU as well. So not a house divided. Not 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 <laughs> least. <laughs> And then, and then you worked a little, after you got your JD, you worked a while, and then you came back to OSU. How did that come about? Oh, my. Let's see. Uh, Dr. Richard Poole had been the vice president uh, for uh, university relations at OSU. And upon his retirement, the position was open. Uh, I had toyed with the notion of applying to to work uh, at OSU one other time and didn't follow through, but I, I vigorously attempted to, to be considered for that position, and lo and behold, I was uh, the successful candidate, and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, just reflecting back on the time that our family spent in Stillwater while I was employed by OSU. Uh, it, it was some of the, the most valuable family time and certainly professional time uh, in my life. Well, during that time period, there were several major events within OSU. I mean, they hired Coach Sutton. Uh, Karsten Creek was finished. Yeah. The, the, roof was, the roof was raised. All sorts uh, of things. I had a role in all those uh, as as vice president. Uh, the the president of the university at the time that Coach Sutton was hired was John Campbell, who came to us from the University of Illinois, 
And uh, I mean, there was no, I mean, it was, it was no public secret. Uh, there had been some kind of uh, NCAA violations at Kentucky and people were concerned about whether or not uh, OSU should move forward to attempt to get a favorite son like Eddie Sutton back as the head basketball coach. Mr. Iva was still living at the time and we had moved when we moved to Stillwater about three houses down from Mr. Iva. And he came down to my house early uh, after we moved uh, to Stillwater and he said, I want you to help me think about something. I'd like for the university to think about uh, Eddie Sutton as uh, a coaching candidate. And so the next day he brought Eddie to my house and we had a great visit. And it was the beginning of a, of a long-term friendship uh, with Coach Sutton. But I went to uh, President Campbell in the OSU Regents and I just said, wow, there's not another person who loves OSU and with the kind of credentialing that Coach Sutton has, uh, this is an opportunity to move our basketball program back to a level that will excite our fans and really engage the university. And then I recall Coach Holder, who was then the golf coach, being very interested in uh, beginning to raise money for Karsten Creek and uh, was a was a part of the discussions with some of the ultimate donors for that uh, uh, for that uh, separate corporation that became so important to the golfing program. Uh, uh, and then uh, was involved in the hiring of Terry Don Phillips to be athletic director at OSU, and we put together a fundraising program. Uh, and, and a way to fund Gallagher Iba. Our facilities across the board in athletics were just substandard. Uh, if we were going to be a significant member of a power conference, uh, and it's not just about athletics, it's about academic peers and that sort of thing. I mean, it's not that we are uh, just athletic peers with University of Oklahoma, and Texas, and then Texas A&M and Missouri and Nebraska, Kansas, and Kansas State. It's that we are their academic peers, and that has incredible meaning in terms of uh, research funding and standing among the academic institutions uh, in the country. So, so upgrading our facilities was terribly important, and putting together the fifty-four million dollars to uh, rehab and expand Gallagher Iva was the first step in just an extraordinary uh, uh, improvement in the athletic facilities on campus. And candidly, because we were so successful in, um, in, academic, in athletic fundraising, it raised the bar and opened more checkbooks for academic giving at OSU than at any time in the history of the, of the institution. So what has happened in the last 25 years from say oh, 1995 to 2020 has been the most incredible uh, fundraising um, period in the history of the, of the university and has made uh, just a transformational difference in the quality of facilities across the board on campus. Not not just athletics, other other ones as well. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what and you know, a lot of time people think, well, there's too much emphasis on athletics in, in universities. And there is a lot. But they do but they do serve as the front door of the university for much of the population and the notoriety, the athletic department, uh, facilities and teams really influences lots of giving uh, to universities. Well, if I've, if I've done my work correctly, you served under with uh, three different presidents, Campbell, Halligan and Smidley. Does that sound right? Does that sound right? Uh, 
Yes. Uh, let's see. If this is going to show my age. There was an interim president who came to us. I cannot I think of his name. He came to us from the National Science Foundation for two or three years. Ray Bowen. And then Dr. Bowen left OSU uh, and went to become president of, uh, of Texas A&M. So it was actually four, though, Dr. Bowen between um, between uh, President Campbell and President Halligan uh, was reasonably short term, two or three years. OK, and then during your time, too, is when I wish you in Tulsa, I wish you Tulsa. Well, you you have a better memory about this than I do. That was really uh, an important addition to the OSU family. Uh, and oof, I spent two or three years uh, serving as the legislative liaison in behalf of OSU at the state legislature as we were getting legislation approved to give uh, uh, to give control of the what was then called University Center in Tulsa uh, and was a consortium of four institutions. Uh, let's see, as I recall, Langston at Northeast and OSU and uh, maybe OU at, at that campus. And it was beginning to work, but it was a little um, it was not seamless. Some institution needed to be the, uh, the lead institution. And so working to get OSU as the lead institution and, and renaming it OSU Tulsa was an enormously important thing for, for OSU and its presence statewide. At that time, uh, there was no major public university presence in Tulsa. No, the University of Tulsa was there, but it is a you know, private institution, and they wanted a public institution. What our concern was, candidly, was if 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 that were to go to OSU, uh, to OU, then OSU would sort of be geographically isolated from both of the major metropolitan areas in Oklahoma. And so we work like the Dickens to try to get uh, controlling interest in OSU Tulsa. And candidly, I think the relationship that OSU now has generally with Tulsa, in the medical community because of the osteopathic college and, uh, and, in, and with the Tulsa business community uh, because of uh, the OSU Tulsa campus uh, in the Greenwood area of Tulsa has made a huge difference in the um, in the view that the state has of our institution. So yeah, that was an important notion too. I don't know when you slept. <laughs> well, it was not a 40 hour a week job, was it? Well, it didn't intend it to be, and, <laughs> but I will say this, it was, it was rewarding. It was, uh, in, incredibly invigor invigorating to see the institution grow and uh, and yeah those are great memories did you after you've done both jobs did you have a preference of which one you'd like better the ad or the vp you know people have asked me that a lot and you know to have been the athletic director where you're where you're in the public eye and probably more than, than the other administrative positions on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I loved it, but I also love, I, I also love being the vice president and working with the, the executive team of the university. Uh, and as I look back across my professional career, I think every job I had was my favorite because it all put the puzzle together in terms of who professionally I am and was. And, you know, if you, if, if you choose to enjoy your work wherever you are, I think, uh, I think you can look back with satisfaction on 
on whatever it is you've got to achieve. So mm, I, I really don't have a favorite. I just love them all. Well, that's fair enough. Well, did you have a mentor or a person that influenced you the most, most influential person? Many. And I probably worked longest and most closely with President Halligan. I just, Jim Halligan became a very, very close father figure in my life. And, oh. uh, uh, though I worked with him professionally, I would walk the plank for him. He's just a wonderful man and, and, and took OSU as president from a point of not decline, but sort of uh, plateauing and, and took it to several new levels because of, of his vision and the things that our executive team uh, decided to do in terms of housing on campus and athletic facilities and the prominence of, of athletics in the Big 12 Conference uh, and the need for real professional large-scale fundraising and improvement in uh, research and research funding. And, and I just think that OSU was a place that just needed to explode in terms of its, uh, of its footprint and its prominence. And, and when President Halligan came to OSU, I think the difference that has become the last 25 years began and just continued on an upward swing. And, and those who have followed him have taken it even to greater levels. But I think he became a part of that significant moment. Was it difficult to leave, to make the decision to leave? Um, yes, but once, once I did, I, I was, uh, of the opinion that there would be others who would follow, who, who would take it forward and they have. And, and so, uh, you know, instead of being right in the middle of it, I'm a, I'm a great fan from the outside on a day to day basis. Well, from, from, You've, you've done well from an OSU grad to where you are today. So if you're ready, we can move into the, our topic of the day. All right. January 27th, 2001. Uh, take us through that day for you. Well, it was a, uh, it was a fairly normal, uh, winter day. I remember uh, that day because we were playing basketball in uh, Boulder at the University of Colorado and we needed to win the game. We had a good team but, but seeding in the NCAA tournament uh, uh, was uh, on the horizon and uh, we, had a, we had a good team and you know, I thought surely we'd go to Boulder and, and win the game. It was an afternoon game uh, and uh, early afternoon start. And we, uh, and we were a little bit flat and didn't play as well as we needed to and lost the ball game. And I, and I was disappointed about that. Um, I remember distinctly, um, my son coming in. I had just gotten out of the shower. It was uh, eight o'clock ish, eight thirty maybe. Uh, and he said, "Dad, Coach Sutton's on the phone." And he said, "Find your father. We need you." Mm -hmm. I stole that line, from Coach Sutton, and used it in my address to the memorial service to those 10 men we lost a few days later. But that's how I, 
that's how I found out. My son came came to me and said, Coach Sutton's on the phone. I, I picked up the telephone and Coach said, Harry, we need you. It's we've got a problem. We're afraid. We're afraid one of the planes carrying a third of our of our party uh, is down, and and we need you to come be with us. At the time, Gallagher Iba, Gallagher Iba renovation was under construction. And uh, the basketball offices, which typically had been in the Gallagher Iba arena, were, uh, you know, under reconstruction and, and renovation. And so the uh, basketball office had temporarily been uh, relocated in the first floor of old Cordell Hall. Uh, and so coach said, meet me at the office. I drove to campus and I arrived just at the time that Eddie had driven in from Stillwater Airport. And as we walked up the sidewalk, he said, the plane is down. I'm afraid we've lost those guys. So coach went in and we waited for a few minutes and then got a call from the Strasburg Police Department in Strasburg, Colorado. It's just a uh, just east of the Denver metropolitan area in the rural uh, farming area in eastern Colorado, and a uh, little town of you know two or three thousand people back then, and. Uh, they confirmed to us that they had found the wreckage of the plane and that there appeared to be no survivors. So the gravity of this circumstance with 10 people involved uh, just suddenly, just suddenly struck us and we had to set up a makeshift phone bank in the in the temporary basketball office quarters. Coach Sutton had the very difficult job of calling 10 families and telling them that their sons and friends and husbands and fathers uh, did not survive a, a plane crash. I was responsible for answering incoming calls from friends and family and media and that sort of thing to to tell them when they call and then steve buzzard who was the sports information director joined me to do that and uh, and talk to and, and talk to media and get continuing reports that were coming in from the uh, law enforcement officials and the uh, uh, air traffic control in the Denver area. So then the next thing that happened after we were, that we went through the process of telling those who, who needed to know is that Steve Buzzard and I went out to the uh, uh, to the Stillwater Airport where a bunch of media had assembled and they were curious and wanting information and whatnot. But the official the official announcement was made by, by Steve Buzzard, who was the sports information director for the athletic department. Of course, being in that role, he knew every one of those 10 very well. It was a horribly difficult thing for him, but he made the official announcement and, and 
told the waiting press and the, the cowboy nation and everybody in Oklahoma the sad news and who all had been lost in that plane crash. Then President Halligan called a meeting of the executive council of the university, uh, four vice presidents and, and himself, and then Terry Don Phillips, who was the athletic director at the time, and the five of us went out to what was a rented facility where the athletic director's office was in the old Frontier Engineering building west of town. And so we got there about 10 o'clock and we all compared notes and began to talk about the implications of this and what the impact would be on the university and on our state. And we made some assignments uh, and we spent the night there and left about 5 a.m. after having done some planning. And, and it, in retrospect, is remarkable to me what all we achieved and what all we thought about and how accurate our views of the impact of this, how, how dead center some of our views were. The first thing I said was, you know, we're dealing with we're dealing with ten people. How would we want our families to be treated? And all kinds of words came up with dignity, with kindness. We would want to be as family members assured of certain things. We had a man on the university staff named Dr. David Bosser was the assistant vice president for uh, business and finance for the university. He had been a decorated military man in his earlier career, uh, and he had been involved in military protocol for the U.S. Army. And I said, the first thing we need to do is get somebody on site in Denver to evaluate everything that is needed there and everything uh, from a protocol standpoint that needs to happen with the, cor uh, uh, the coroner's office and identification of, uh, of the victims. And we need somebody who could serve as a liaison to give us information because the uh, families and family members are just uh, going to be very, very uh, curious to know what all is going on. And so we tried to do this as much like military protocol in terms of the, uh, the kind of treatment that the victims had. to make certain their families knew that they were treated with love. And so Dr. Bosserman was on the next plane to Denver and spent the next several weeks there just combing through information with all the authorities and taking care of all those very painful details uh, that needed to happen to provide assurance Then we began to think about things like, how do we honor these men, both in the short term and the long term? And in, that, in those first conversations overnight, uh, we thought there has to be some kind of a, of a very a very important memorial service to honor them. And, and 
their lives in service to OSU. So we began to think of a campus-wide kind of uh, activity, a uh, memorial activity, which happened the following Wednesday, as I recall, where their lives were honored there. Each of the 10 had individual memorial services, but a group service where there was the opportunity for the entire campus to pour out its emotion and to, uh, uh, and to love those guys. We, uh, we talked about what can we do, even at that early time, what can we do to symbolize the feeling of the institution and the, and the grief that we all felt? How can we permanentize, if I can use that word, our feelings? And we even talked about where we would locate a physical memorial. If we talked about the most logical place would be in Gallagher Island. In fact, in the southwest corner of the main lobby of Gallagher Island is the memorial that we built and we we talked that night about what can we do to assure the families and the university and the whole state that this is a matter of such importance that it really is a a sort of turning point for the university to prove what the soul of this institution is like and how it's different than lots of public institutions. I have had over the last 20 years, I don't know how many thousands of people just say, that's the point in time where we really came to believe that Oklahoma State University is a different place, that there is a more family oriented environment and people care about each other because so many of us who attended OSU or worked there and fell in love with the place came to feel a sense of family that just doesn't exist on a lot of public university campuses. Uh, and I think people really came to believe that there's something special about, about OSU because of the way that, that the university community and the alumni community and even the whole state just came together and pulled together and helped together and and that I think sets OSU apart even to this day. Uh, but the first night of just thinking how significant this event was and would be to the university, I think laid the foundation for how we reacted to it. Uh, for at least the next year, and then for all the years that have followed, and even that night, the five of us, as we sat there, came up with things that we thought might be sort of, I don't want to say catchphrases, but monikers for how we would remember these five men we lost. And we came up that night with the notion of, we just won't forget. We will remember, and to this day, 20 years later, it's at the rafters of Gallagher Iba. We use it on, on, uh, on you know, the advertisements for the annual uh, fundraising scholarship drive and, and all that. Golly, in the, in the ensuing days, we, we planned that memorial and we started to think about 
the uh, the memorial alcove that would be the permanent uh, remembrance in Gallagher Island. Uh, we thought about things that we could do to recognize and remember the families. Uh, there were so many, many generous calls and gifts that were made to the families that we were able to do some special things for the children, the, the siblings, et cetera, of those who were, who were lost. Uh, and, and by the time that President Halligan appeared at the memorial service the following Wednesday, we were able to say that every, every child who was either a, a, a child or a, a sibling of the, the men lost would be able to attend any of the OSU branches with a full scholarship for four years. So I think recognizing how we can help the families treat them and their loved ones with, with dignity and the promise that we would just never forget. Um, was an important beginning to, to how we, to how we chose to deal with this. I'm rambling, but. No, you're doing well. And how about, the, talk a little bit about acquiring the land for the for the memorial in Colorado. <clears throat> yeah, we thought in addition to the memorial in Stillwater, it was important for there to be a remembrance at the site, and the the, the crash occurred. Uh, a mile or so outside the little town of Strasbourg on a on a dairy farm, and uh, we got with the owners of the land, and, and we said we'd like to acquire part of the of your land so that we can build a memorial, and that in the future those who remember this incident could come to the actual site and pay their respects. And so we did do that. And it was, as I recall, maybe eight or 10 months after the, after the crash that we were able to dedicate a, a memorial outside Strasbourg to honor the 10 guys. Um, and it's a dignified memorial uh, I'll never forget going out there and then seeing that uh, that dedication for and we took all the families and the family members and when we pulled up to the site it was an unusually cold day for the late summer very early fall in, uh, in Colorado, dreary. The, 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 the kind of weather that you would say, well, yeah, if you're going to have a very sad, very somber day, this is exactly what it'd be like. Spitting rain, you know, the aching parents siblings and spouses I mean, that was a difficult day to join hands and walk from the road to the very place where your loved ones breathe their last uh, but again i think it was part of the assurance that we won't forget that we have an obligation to tell those who come after us that these were special people who made an impact on our university and 
that we care deeply about. Uh, some of the things that are etched in my mind that I'll never forget are the the grief not yet a year after the incident as those family members saw those those granite reliefs unveil with their with their family members faces just feet away from actually occur. Never forget. It. Did all of them go? Did uh, someone from each family actually go? Yes. Do you remember? Yes, absolutely. And and it was cathartic in a lot of ways for the families and for those of us from OSU, but for the people of Strasbourg. Colorado as well, suddenly to have been thrust in a situation where their community was suddenly in the national and international news, but to also be able for them to express their grief, because those first responders were the first to deal with the incident that was thrust on. And so they felt the need to express their care and their reassurance to the families. And it gave the families the opportunity to meet the special people who cared first for their loved ones in the circumstance. So, uh, I won't forget that. Well, and then not too much longer past that, they dedicated the one in Gallagher. They did. Uh, and it was beautiful as well. And again, every time one of these things happens, um, I guess it's just that much closer to turning corners and beginning to heal. And now as you look back at at the incident, certainly it doesn't it doesn't make it any it doesn't make things go away, but people have begun to heal, lives have moved on, people in those families have achieved incredible things professionally new children have been born you know grandchildren family members have graduated people have had extraordinary professional careers but the pain and the ache never goes away yet that incident helped i think weld people together uh, in a special way because we cope with a tragedy as a group. Well, if I recall, the memorial service in the in Gallagher was very well attended. It was it was packed to the rims, uh, and and sitting up on stage and watching the people. Uh, It was a it was a powerful service that touched a lot of people. I uh, was asked to deliver um, a uh, sort of a, a, a a religious perspective into the deal and. Uh, it must have been watched by a lot of people. And it must have been regarded well, 
several years later on the occasion of the 9-11 incident in, in New York, White House speechwriter under President George W. Bush called me and said, do you mind if the president uses the same scriptures and the same notice in the memorial service to honor the lost at, you know, in the, in the World Trade Center? Would you mind if he uses those same influences in uh, in the National Cathedral Memorial. And I said, well, would be quite honored, frankly. But I think I think a lot of people saw how we handled the circumstance and believed that it was dignified and and caring and it had ramifications that we frankly didn't ever contemplate. Yeah, I remember you saying something about to em embrace the, the players on the team because they were young men that needed to live beyond this devastating moment. I recall it. Yeah. You, you know, another thing that I that I recall is we unveiled the little alcove in, in the Gallagher Island. There's a member of the music faculty at OSU uh, named Brand Adams. Dr. Adams is a, is a brilliant composer and quite a valued asset to the university. But he took a line out of the message I delivered at the memorial service. And he wrote an anthem called Father to the Fathers. Uh, and it was unveiled, or its debut was at the unveiling of the of, of the statue and the and the little alcove there. Uh, one of the one of the interesting things. And I think I shared this story with you once earlier, Tanya, is that we were talking about what shall we do in Gallagher Iva that will make this a will make an impression on people who will walk through this building for for the rest of time for so long as that building stands. It's right near the academic center where every student athlete who you know, attends OSU, goes to their daily academic uh, activities and, and class planning and, and uh, computing and that sort of thing. And, and we wanted that to be a, a, a heavily trafficked spot that, that everybody would have to see. And, so, and, and then people who come to games there. And the visiting teams who come to play at OSU have to pass it to go into the visitor locker rooms, whether it be football or basketball or whatever. And so we decided on what we would like it to look like. And one of the things that we wanted to have was the statue of a cowboy that would reflect sort of the, uh, the reaction that the university and our state had toward the loss of these guys. And we call it the the Neiman Cowboy. And uh, we chose at the suggestion of one of the families who had lost a son in the in the crash, uh, a noted sculptor named Harold Hogan, who had OSU ties and is a is a tremendous uh, Western art sculptor. So I invited him to campus and brought him into my into my office at Whitehurst, and I said. H, we want you to think about uh, a, a sculpture that you can do to reflect a grieving cowboy. And 
So I just des described the emotion of the of the uh, incident to him, and he knelt down beside my desk and began to scribble, and he scribbled mm. in just a couple of minutes. Uh, the image of a cowboy with his hat resting on the ground and, he, and you can tell he's just in terrible pain and grief. And I said to Harold, how did you do that so quickly? And he said, well, except for the face, that's me. I said, tell me more. And he said, several years ago, my wife and I were riding our horses just recreationally one, one uh, Sunday afternoon on our ranch near Kremlin, Northwest Oklahoma. And one of our friends uh, had come to tell us that our grandson had died. And so in his own reflection on his own grief, he was able to capture the he was able to capture the mood of the institution and how it felt about this plane crash. And from the time he sketched this image on the, on the corner of my desk until it appeared in life size in bronze to be erected in Gallagher Iba, the image didn't change. Um, but again, I think the dedication of that memorial and the one in Colorado, uh, I think, were tasteful uh, and were done to show the depth of grief, uh, but the care and the permanence of our feeling in regard for, for these guys that we lost. Is there a significance to the hat touching the ground? Or? Well, according to the sculptor, he said to me, there are only two reasons why a good cowboy will ever let his hat touch the ground. The first is he's been bucked off and a hat has been lost. And when he is grieving, mm -hmm. he won't otherwise let his hat touch the ground. But that's just a reflection of the detail to how emotional these losses were. Well, you can feel it just by looking at it. At least some of us can. Indeed. How did the rest of the memorial that's behind that, like the, the granites and the, the inscriptions and all that, how did that come about? We put in place a committee to sort of work with us to design what we thought we would like to see. And certainly we wanted to have in, in uh, granite uh, uh, the faces of those we lost. And then there, and then there is a, an indication of a little uh, biographical information about each of the 10 men on, on that wall. Then there were some, then there were some donations, and I mean this in, the, in a very positive sense, that were sort of rogue deals that were outside the university that people wanted to use their money to create uh, memorials that we thought were less than as dignified as we wanted them to be. So we asked the people to just put their money in our, in our memorial and let us sort of coordinate the benches and all the things so that it was a unified look and not hodgepodge at various locations around the community. Uh, and, it, and, and I think, we got our arms wrapped around all the good that people wanted to do uh, and made it look uh, coordinated. And I've not been to the site in Colorado, but it's similar wording. Yes. Uh, 
it, it's 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 an outdoor uh, plaza there, uh, so it's not an inside deal. But the but the faces and uh, information about the incident, about the and about the young men uh, that we lost is uh, is well documented and, and displayed there. So. Um, I, I think the families were very, very pleased with both memorials uh, that that, that honor their their lost. I've I've seen a photograph of the one in Colorado and noticed it had the number of miles from right. from that spot to. And and one of the let's see I've. Just a goofy thought that what we wanted to what we wanted to say as we dedicated that was that they couldn't go too far away from Stillwater without knowing the familiar place they they had traveled from without knowing that the people back at that familiar place had love for them. So what we did is we got Terry Wheeler, who was then the chief florist for Colonial Florist in Stillwater. And I went to Terry and I said, I want you to build the most beautiful wreath that you can find from the foliage on this campus. Because I'm going to take it, I'm going to take it to Strasbourg when we go, and I want to lay that as a part of the unveiling of that. And so there were berries from the various uh, hedges, and there were leaves from the various kinds of trees and branches from the evergreens and, and flowers from the central gardens and it was just a gorgeous wreath about three and a half to four feet um, and we laid that there with with the notion that regardless of where people go from OSU, you can't ever leave it because it's always in your heart. Ian's thought of a lot of things. Yes. yes. Do you, do, you come, do you come back for the anniversaries? I'm I, I, I'm, I'm even in this year, which was the the COVID year, we had the group together to uh, you know as many as we could. But yes, and, and I stay in touch with uh, with several of the families. We put together a a committee of ten, probably about the second day. And we just said, every family needs an ambassador from the OSU staff to stay in touch with them, find out everything they need, get any information they want to know about, uh, and just coordinate with the families. And that group of 10 became fairly well bonded, though not all of us knew each other terribly well before that incident. But the fact that Every family had somebody that they could lean on and cry on their shoulder and ask tough, penetrating questions and yell at if they wanted to because of their frustration. Um, but whatever we could do from a personal touch standpoint, um, we, we tried to get we tried to get those people who would just give a lot of their time, and it did take a lot of time over the next year uh, or so to 
to be sure they were always kept in the know and knew exactly what the university was doing. Then as we began later to work with the National Transportation Safety Bureau and, and find out any information that they had or were uncovering about the incident, uh, putting to bed any rumors that, you know, were, were found to be untrue and all that kind of thing. Just being sure that the families had information uh, and, and, and care and answers to questions was, was awfully important. And then at some point there was a task force created to do the travel policy to address the travel policy issues? <clears throat> yes. One of the one of the things that occurred to me and uh, I don't remember who suggested it, but I chaired it. We put together a committee to develop a travel policy for OSU from that point forward to be sure that we looked at everything we were doing to be sh to be absolutely certain that there was no stone unturned such that the when student athlete travel was involved we were operating from a state of the art procedure mm -hmm. and we even involved, I mean, we involved student athletes, we involved administrators, we involved coaches, we involved alumni. We even, we even called upon some of the family members who had just a few months earlier lost a loved one. And we said, help us be sure this never happens again. We need to have a state-of-the-art policy that has procedures and checks and balances to be sure that we uh, are doing the right things for our young men and women who represent all this OSU all over the country. Uh, and frankly, that took courage on the part of those parents who had lost a beloved child. Uh, Frankly, we got asked some very tough questions. There were times we got yelled at, but we had to go through the process. And I think we developed for OSU the state-of-the-art travel, travel policy for, uh, for athletic teams. It wasn't too much later that I was named athletic director, and so I carried that on to the Big 12 athletic directors and then to the NCAA Division I athletic directors, and then after that, Division II and, and the lower division schools to say, here is a model that you can use or your travel accommodations and actions of your institution. And I'm pleased to say that because of the work that OSU did, I think a lot of NCAA institutions now travel more safely and with greater uh, care than for our incidents. So maybe one of the positive things that happened as a result of the tragedy in our case was that more student athletes at a lot of places are now traveling more safe. Mm -hmm. Well, on, during that entire time, other coaches were supportive from around the country, I take it? Um, well, it was really more athletic directors. Okay. Uh, Okay. who were responsible for the, the entire travel programs of their, of their own institutions. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
and and I still occasionally have, though I've been gone from the athletic department at OSU for 15 years or so. Now. But but I uh, I still occasionally get a call or a or a note from a from a former colleague at an institution here and there saying thanks for the for the role you played in being sure we we travel more safely. So besides that, and then the memorials and the tuition for the siblings and children, um, there were scholarships, or was that a different? That may have come from a, a different source. The the scholarships that they have named in each one of the the men's names. Uh, that was an intentional. That was an intentional thing that that okay. came uh, a little later on to say, well. Yeah, we will remember, but let's talk about how can we do more to help people who want to study in the same area as my son or my uh, or my nephew. We'd like to donate some money. Well, okay, let's set up let's set up scholarships in uh, athletic training or journalism and broadcasting or whatever was of interest. To the particular family, and so as a result, even a further uh, continuation of, of our remembering them is to have set in place scholarships that honor their legacy. It's done a lot. Um, if if you've got the replica behind you, how many of those did did he make? Uh, Reach. This is a. This is a, uh, there was a, a series of 50 of these uh, that were made. Uh, each of the families was uh, given a copy of this, but 50 is all that were made. They were all uh, in the, in the uh, owned by OSU. Uh, the mold was broken uh, after the after the fifty were made and will not be uh, will not be replicated. Uh, so it is a limited edition and will remain so. Uh, so it's mostly family, then the, and then the ones in the immediate cir circle around that time whole time period. Yes. Yes. And I, do, and I do believe that anybody who was blessed to receive one uh, highly treasures. Mm -hmm. And then for a long time, people would wear their lapel pins. Yes. That became sort of the, the symbol for the entire the entire tragedy is that the orange lapel pins were worn by people from the from the time of the memorial. Uh, we still wear them back every every time uh, that we gather together. I wear them to every athletic event I go to in Oklahoma City. One of the one of the touching things, and again, I, I say he was my mentor, but President Halligan, who now is in his 80s, uh, after he became president emeritus and retired from OSU, he, he, went, he was elected to the Oklahoma State Senate, served several years in the state Senate. Mm -hmm. He would always wear that little orange lapel pin, and, he, and people would ask him about that, and he said, but but I'm not just wearing it now. I have specific orders to my family and in my, in my will and such that I, upon my demise, I may be buried with that mm. in my lapel. Uh, and, uh, and I think it made such an impact and was such a turning point in his career. One time, I mean, you just think back a 
about these things that you, that you haven't thought about in a long time. But one of the very wealthiest OSU alums who has just given a lot of money to, to OSU and its academic components. His wife said that when he died, one of the last things he said is that he wanted one of those little uh, lapel pins for his burial. And I was going to his funeral service in Memphis and five minutes before his funeral service, his wife led me to his casket where I put that lapel pin in his suit that he was buried with. It. But that was one of his last requests because this incident touched a man of enormous international wealth and intellect and influence. That's what he wanted. But I think were the I think were the components of of the entire reaction put in place as they were, perhaps it wouldn't have had such an impact on people's lives going forward. Well, looking over the last 20 years, how has the university met or not met their promise to remember? Well, I think in a lot of ways it, it, it has and will continue to, I mean, you know, from the from the memorials to the scholarships to the annual activities and, and the, the, you know, fundraising um, uh, you know activities and the, the run each year. And, uh, I I just think I think I think all those things music that has been written about it, and the, 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 the memorial gifts, and, and all that just suggest that we don't intend, even after 20 years or 50 or 100, mm -hmm. get the notion that 10 really fine people passed from us tragically, but their spirit unified us and gave us a sense of our common humanity and the goodness that is in people and the, uh, the importance of an institution on all our lives. I think it's going to be hard to end without some, I mean, with a better question. I and mean, that's, that's a good way to sum it up, isn't it? <laughs> well, I hope. Uh, did you participate, have you, have you participated in the run? Um, initially? I, I think the times I've been in it, I did more of I did more a quick step walk. <laughs> that would be me. Uh, the fun walk. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would be doing too. I mean, not that, not that this matters to this. One of the goofy things that happened to me uh, not too long after this is that I decided I was a very spry, young, invincible person. And so I decided to take a fall from a 14-foot ladder and broke a hip. So I didn't do so well in the early years of the run. And that kind of uh, kind of changed my lifestyle a little bit. And I, I 
I walk but don't run nearly as much. I'm thinking we all could have done the virtual one this past year. Yeah. With COVID since it was virtual. <laughs> but that has brought a, a lot of a lot of funds and resources, you know, forward to with with the counseling service here on campus. Uh, yeah. you, you know, the thing that I the thing that I look back, let's see, I'm gonna I'm gonna I hope you edit this out. Oh, when you when you start thinking about how uh, what things were watersheds, I remember two years later in say two thousand three. It is the first time that it is the first time that our basketball team went back to Boulder to play a game against the University of Colorado. Mm -hmm. Our new travel policy was in place then. So everybody uh, on the team with the traveling party was on the same jet. We all flew in, but flew into the same airport, went into the very same hangar that the guys had come out in three planes, three smaller planes, that fateful night. University of Colorado did a marvelous job honoring our team and OSU. And again, you talk about the commonality of people and our com the common good in people. Uh, I'll never forget how kind the people of Colorado were to OSU uh, for that whole time. But that night they honored our team and our team was visibly moved by being honored as they were during the game and at halftime. But then we went out into that hangar and got in that plane and there and the air was as so heavy and the tension such that you could cut it with a knife because some of the guys on that team remembered two years before where they had been and how they were those who survived because they were on different aircrafts. But that night, there was just a, such an emotional departure. But when we, when we ascended, left that area of Colorado when we had come to flying altitude. You could see on those coaches and those and those players and the, and the staff just a feeling that of hope that they had sort of left behind a very frightening negative experience and they, they had sort of turned the corner to move forward and though only a few were there you can just sense what a turning point that was, that we had been there, we had faced the giant, we expressed our love for the friends we lost, but we knew there was something else ahead that life was taking us to. And just through that whole episode, the more we learned 
and the more revelation from the NTSB, you know, frankly, insurance settlements that that help the families who had lost so much, all that stuff working together pointed us to what lay ahead in life. And I I can't tell you now what a joy it is to get with the members of those 10 families to see what's happened since. Because those moms and dads who lost a treasure now have other treasures because their other children have grandsons who are playing ball, who are cheerleading, and who are national merit scholars. And some of those dads, Will Hancock's dad, has gone on to have just a, an incredible career as the first the head of the NCAA men's basketball and now the head of the of the national collegiate football national championship series there are lawyers who have emerged from those families the, there are more college graduates who are now doing great things in research there are there are children who were very young at the time their fathers were killed in that plane crash, who are now world-class scholars in great universities. So, you know, you see the hope that life has brought to the lives that were shattered 20 years ago. And you think uh, that's a blessing to see. Not that we've forgotten, but we've lived with the grief and moved to the next chapter of life. Yeah, it comes full full circle, kind of, when you, when you said that during the memorial service, a uh, university should be judged in part by how it cares about people. That, that speaks to that. And I hope we were good stewards. <laughs> well, while we're talking a little bit about that to the 2003 team. Well, went on to the two, 2004 NCAA, double, NCAA Final Four, didn't they? Yes. And some of the peop- some of the players on that team would have been freshmen. Yeah, a couple of them were. Yeah. And again, that's one of the remarkable elements of this. I'll never forget, there was a guy who worked for the university who came to me after the first game we played, um, after the after the crash. And we just beat thunder out of our opponent. And he came and said, Oof, that was the most helpful medicine any of us could have had. So during this horrible event, the steadfastness of the players and the basketball program in particular, and in particular, I would salute Coach Sutton. Eddie and his staff never quit believing, and I think till the day he died, uh, he believed that winning and creating further that tradition of basketball excellence was what the players and the staff members and the broadcast giant that we lost that night would have wanted to happen. And and, and just three years after a tragic accident, as we were trying to heal, basketball program was putting itself in a position where with just a few seconds left against St. Joseph, little John Lucas 
He had a three-point shot to send us to the final four. And that was that was great medicine for always. Yeah, it's just a lot of that's still in my memory too. Um, not as as good as yours because you were in the throes of that. But we were here at that time and went to the memorial service. And you know, my husband had a couple of the the kids in his classes, and we just remember, and we remember twenty years later. So some of us are keeping the promise too, along with you. Good. <laughs> On your list of things, is there anything else that I didn't ask that we need to discuss? You know, I think the uh, I think the main things we have covered. What do you think? Uh, what would you like current and future students to to know about this? That a circumstance like this, despite the tragedy can bring people to understand their similarities more than their differences. And if we focus on what, what common things there are, what we have in common as people, we get further in life than if we are divided by what separates us. Despite what we lost, I think this made more a family out of OSU than anything I know of in my in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I love to reminisce and I love to talk about OSU and the thing that people want to talk about when I bump into old acquaintances is how the institution handled this incident with dignity and care and I think projecting to a lot of people that regardless of who you are at OSU, you're, you're part of the family and you're a part of a tradition and a heritage that gives you a brotherhood and sisterhood with a whole lot of people. It just doesn't happen at a lot of universities. And I would say to anybody, if, if, if you are looking for an institution to attend where you will be cared for and where you will be valued as family, I've been on a lot of university campuses as a, as a vice president and as a, a and an athletic director, and I haven't found one that I think would have been more perfect for me than OSU. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm still recruiting for OSU. <laughs> <laughs> and did your children come here? They absolutely did. Yeah, okay. absolutely did. Uh, and so did, you know, so my wife and I and, and both our children, and we're doing and we're doing a little coaching with now four little grandchildren uh, and trying to persuade them that it's an awful <laughs> place to go. Well, just bring them to campus enough and they'll get they'll get attached. They spell a lot of time there. <laughs> well, I usually, before I ask my last question, I'm curious about the, how did it come about that the library bells toll at that, at that hour, that hour each year? I have not asked anybody that, how that happened. Do you know? I, I don't. I don't specifically, but I'm glad it's continuing. And, it, it does. And uh, I'll have to ask the yet, yet, yet another, yet another reminder, and I think that's entirely appropriate. I'll have to ask the dean. She should know. I'll ask her. Good. Okay. My last question then for you is: How do you want people to remember you? 
Um, boy, now there's there's the next long answer, but I think I think I hope my legacy is is someone who tried to make a difference wherever I was to to help people grow, to help people uh, be educated and better able uh, to to compete in a in a in a changing world economy. Uh, I hope they will say I was a man of integrity. I hope they say I was a man of God. I hope they say I was a uh, a good father and friend. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, thank you very much for remembering with us today and for sharing how these 10 men continue to touch you and others, even in their physical absence. Exactly. It's, it's been a, a um, thank you for spending the afternoon with us. Thank you, and I appreciate the university uh, helping to perpetuate the uh, the memories and uh, and the commitment we all.